I keep busy, but it's all very managed stress. So I know my boundaries, I know my limits, and I take on less these days. And what I do take on, I make sure it's really worthwhile and it's good quality things. So I'm working less, but I guess I'm working smarter, not harder. Welcome to the LMF Network podcast. My name is Sonia Barlow. I'm the founder, CEO, and host. This podcast is all about sharing career stories, spotlighting amazing individuals doing extraordinary things. The LMF Network is on a mission to build the careers and confidence of 25,000 people by 2025 through mentorship, masterclasses, and meaningful conversations. This podcast is what you've been asking for. We cover everything from career stories, spotlight extraordinary individuals, all the way to how to overcome imposter syndrome, build on resilience, and just succeed in the way that you want within the workplace. There are people in the podcast space mm. and in the business podcast space that do not talk to me, do not invite me and block to mute me because- Because of your podcast. Because of my podcast. And I know that because I've been told it. That's so odd. I mean, at least that's compliment they're threatened by it. What are you threatened by? Like, I don't know. I think it's weird because podcasts are so unique because you're talking, like no one can be you. Like no podcast will ever sound the same. At the same time, I think some podcasts are becoming quite noisy. What do you mean by that? So if you're interviewing the same or similar people, same or similar concepts, you're not really learning anything new. Mm. And I feel like the podcasting space is ready for a bit of disruption and ready for a little bit of unique kind of selling points. Just something different, a little bit different. Yeah, that's true. I also think some podcasts just talk about things for the sake of it. Yes. And it's just when you actually th like listen to what people are saying, it's just waffle. Like there's no actual value yeah to the podcast unless but it's like humorous waffle and funny yeah, waffle, and you're like this is funny and laughing but when it's like an important topic absolutely. and they're just doing it to virality is so frustrating because you can see it and also when people haven't researched the topic yeah or the guest and i'm like well you don't know the guest you clearly don't know the topic you were just saying it for this point of putting something out mm -hmm. there it's not really adding value but do you feel that similarly in the social media content space because you are a content creator yeah i think it it's such a different space because with content creation, like you are your brand. So your name, your face, your personality is your brand. Whereas with a podcast, I feel like it represents something or like there's an angle to it or you're talking about specific topics. Whereas I think as a content creator, it's like a very different space completely. And if you're a content creator, is that the same as being a freelancer, self-employed, business person, entrepreneur? Like, are you using these terms interchangeably? I think there's so many similarities, but there's also differences. So like, whilst I believe I am an entrepreneur to an extent because my content creation and my social media is my business, I am my brand. So I constantly have to look at my business structure, the strategy to grow it, the data behind it. At the same time, it's very different because it's not a product or a service based mm. business, which is what I would view an entrepreneur as. And in the same sense as a freelancer, I think with a freelancer, you're freelancing in a particular type of service. So whether it's photography, videography, whereas yes, content creation is a service in itself, but you're also doing the modeling, the editing, the videographing, the scripting. So I think content creation is like an umbrella term, but there's overlaps within those spaces, but it's not exactly the same thing. Do you like it when people call you a content creator? I love it. Although... I love it more than being called an influencer. Oh, I'll, they're okay. pretty much the same thing, let's be honest. Content creators and influencers, it's just, it's they're just the same thing. You wrapped it up differently. Yeah, but I think influencers come with so many negative connotations, which is why I try and like stay really far away from that term. But in actual fact, they're the same thing. So I like being called a content creator just because I feel like that name is so much more respected. I think it's a growing industry. People refer to the creator economy. And I think creator is a lot more broad than influencer, even though all content creators are influencers. Yeah, it's a recent term and, and content creation is, is a growing industry, especially when the trends are showing that individuals no longer want like snazzy, famous, spicy marketing. They want re real, they want authentic, they want the ordinary person doing very cool things, which is quite exciting. Like personally, when people call me an influencer, I'm, not, I'm like, I'm not an influencer. I'm an influential person because I'm a person of influence. I'm still trying to build that influence. Isn't that what an influencer is? No, I don't <laughs> think so. I think, I don't know, because when influencers started, listen, like, let's be really honest about it. Influencers once upon a time were the people that were like doing dances on TikTok and then they were going mm. viral, right? I personally was not one of those people, but I loved watching. I just didn't have the confidence to do it. 
an influential person, I think, is someone who's like more of a thought leader and expert or a renowned person in that space mm -hmm. with particular topic threads and can go and speak about it offline and online. Whereas I think an influencer is someone who has the social following and has specific topics that they are known for, but they're also able to float around. But I think that line is now so blurred mm -hmm. because people with followings are also expected to talk about certain things or raise awareness for something or have some form of specialist knowledge and you can be both. And maybe it's because I almost want people to believe that it's the former. And I myself do a lot of those things that you mentioned in terms of thought leadership or creating that sort of community, not just having a following based on the way I look. But do you, do, do you think your influencing and your content creation is different because you left a corporate job to do this? Do you think it gives you substance? It does, but I also play sports semi-professionally mm -hmm. or I love fashion or I love to travel and all of those things provide me with substance, not just the corporate job. But I think, yes, because I left the corporate job, I treat this so much more as a business and I see the bigger picture more than just taking pictures and videos of myself. Do you miss working in corporate? No, I don't. I think the only oh, side turned me yeah, I, I, People ask me this all the time and I think ultimately I don't. What I miss is having the financial stability, like the lack of volatility, having a team. But I feel like I'm getting myself to a position where I actually am getting those things as someone who's self-employed and as a content creator. So I'm getting to a point now where everything that I miss from corporate and the benefits I was getting from being employed I've actually earned for myself on my own now. So that's quite a nice thing to be able to say. Are you registered on Companies House as self-employed or as a business? So I'm still a sole trader. You're a sole so, trader? Yeah, so I'm, I've got my UTR number, which is your unique tax registration number. However, I am now looking to move into forming a limited company and trading through that. I just think it'll be more beneficial for tax purposes. Tanby, I've paid so much tax this morning. <laughs> I didn't even know yeah, that I that should have paid is. that much tax. And I I literally, I paid, I was on the phone with HMRC for an hour and a half this morning, just asking the questions and trying to figure it out because I don't come from an accounting or tax background. And even people who do, the tax rules change all the time. It's so, so bad. hard to keep up with it. And then you've got different tax rules for employment. Absolutely. Self -employment. So I'm like asking all these questions. I have a good accountant, which is great. But I'm like asking questions and they're able to give the time. So anyone who's thinking of learning about taxes, just go and ring up HMRC and they will help you. But also the reason I bring that up is one, because after paying that much tax, I was like, I don't want to do anything. I just want to come and do this because I've got things to say. <laughs> but two, it put me in a really blessed and privileged position to be like, oh, the tax I was due to pay, I paid there and then. Yeah. I was like, oh, not only do I have that much saved, but I have that much money in my account. And it made me realize that one of the best things I did was leave the corporate structure because then what you earn and what you gain is very much dependent on the effort that you put in. Mm. Yeah, I think one thing that I didn't like about corporate is exactly that. Like I was working so hard. Like I used to do 12 to 16 hour days. And if you work that out by the hour based on my salary, it probably was minimum wage for certain parts of the year. Yes, it was a really credible firm. Yes, I was a consultant. I was in like learning so much, but ultimately I'm working for someone else. I pay an extremely high level of tax and for what, like to be mentally burnt out and like, it's hard because I think, yeah, you get a salary, you know, you're getting paid at the end of the month. You get so many benefits from being employed. What like do you healthcare. miss about being employed? I just think that, like I said, the financial stability and the people, those are the two main things that I miss the most. Do you know what I miss? Sick days. <laughs> now that I've come to the point where I don't get sick days, I miss a sick day because as someone who's self-employed or runs their own business or their own brand, when I wake up and I'm not having a great day or my head is not in a great place or I'm just aching and that client needs something done in there, you can't just take it off sick. Like, no, it is, it is dependent on you. Whereas when I was in the corporate world and especially at the start of my career, I was so passive and so scared and so ignorant that I was like, oh my God, if I take annual leave and if I take sick days, they're actually gonna fire me. So I used to work through my pain. I used to work through my sickness. I used to, there was a point where I, my manager, super weird, but you don't have anyone to talk about. It. Well, at least I didn't at that point. And I remember I had three sick days and I had a holiday the next week. And she was like, 
Well, because you were off sick, like you should really think about not going on holiday and getting your work done. I was like, what are you talking about? And in my head, I was like, but in my head, I, I thought about it. And then afterwards, I was like, why would I even think about that? Like you're entitled to sick days, you're entitled to annual leave mm. and it helps you to prevent burnout. And I only bring that up because you mentioned that there's a level of burnout in corporate, but there's also a level of burnout as a creator. Yeah, there is. And that's something you've brought up. Not only do you have work for your clients, like if you're working with brands or you have your own clients, for example, but you also have to get in front of a camera or get on the radio and you can't be ill or tired or mentally going through something. Or if you are, you quite literally have to pretend you're not because a camera can see right through that. So I think that's one of the things I guess I overlooked before I quit my job. I really underestimated how every day you've got to bring your best self. You've got to look good physically. You've got to feel good mentally. And it's hard to fake that if you're not. My grandma passed away last week and I was so sad, like as anyone would be. And I felt so guilty, but I physically couldn't work because I couldn't bring myself to get up, put makeup on, smile, talk about anything really. And I felt really guilty for taking that time off. But if I was in a corporate job, I would be entitled to like grieving time or whatever it's called. So I think that's one of the things I've underestimated is that you actually have to look and feel good all the time. And that can then obviously lead to burnout. What do you do? Do you manage client expectations? Do you go back to them or do you take yourself offline? I just take on less, to be honest. So instead of getting to a point where I'm just like, I'm working so much, I've got so much going on, I just can't handle it. I just have very relaxed weeks these days. Mm. And yes, I keep busy, but it's all very managed stress. So I know my boundaries, I know my limits, and I take on less these days. And what I do take on, I make sure it's really worthwhile and it's good quality things. So that, yeah, I'm working less, but I guess I'm working smarter, not harder. And how has your life changed since you decided to, when you started in the content game? And I only say that because I was on a podcast just yesterday, which I think comes out in September sometime. And I said, look, in the beginning when I was getting the awards and the recognition, I loved it. Don't get me wrong, I loved it. But at this point, I'm like, that's not really what I'm doing this for anymore. And also they don't come with funds. It doesn't come with substance. It just comes with a nice trophy and that's it. But secondly, my point was, when I first started getting invited to events, I was like, oh my God, you want me? I will be there. I will be there early. I'll be there till late. I will be, I will talk about it. I will rave about it. And now it's like, there's only so many events you can say yes to because it's actually quite draining and exhausting. It's exhausting. I think I've become so selective. Yeah. Not only with events, but with campaigns, with the people I interact with, basically everything that makes up every little aspect of my business. I am so selective. I used to, like you, go to every single event, any time of day. And now I actually just take a step back and I think, what am I going to gain from this? Is there anyone there that I would love to meet? And if it's just the same people in the same room doing the same thing as last week, then I'm okay to give it a minute. Yeah. And also when companies like, oh, it's great exposure, you'll connect with X, Y, Z. I'm like, are you connecting me with them? Are you going to make introductions? exposure doesn't really pay my bills so I really literally now go through the speaker list the agenda list and I'm like is there someone that I can connect with myself or I'm already connected with and or am I really going to gain value from doing this versus could I be at home learning to cook or could I be on my sofa resting or could I be working on this client proposal that needs to be sent out because when you're a content creator very similar to like running a business which is service based or, or podcast based or consultancy based but also because I myself am a content creator and of some kind, you have to do a lot of pitching. Yeah, I don't so much anymore. That's great. But yeah. <laughs> no, I think the reason I don't is because I have management and I think they've really changed the game. For okay, me. that's definitely something we should talk about. But did I did pitching in the beginning. I think I did it alongside my corporate job, right, for two years. So I never had the capacity to pitch to brands. And I was really fortunate that I was in a position where I had so much inbound that I just took that rather than like thinking, okay, like who do I want to work with? Yeah, like, who do I want to make time to pitch to? So for those two years, it was all inbound. And then I signed to management and that's when pitching really came in. So the outreach side of things. I have tried to pitch to a few, but I think one, it really makes a difference to your contacts are. And two, I, get, I just didn't have the capacity that for it. Sense. So because I've managed to somewhat outsource that to management, they do that for me. And I know it's a really like, back and forth process. Yeah, absolutely. And so when we started the LMF network, the first three, two and a half, three years is all inbound. So I would say 80% of everything we do is inbound. A lot of the campaigns I had was inbound. 
But then I realized that I guess I was trying to also build up my outbound skills. So I did off not a lot. I would say I did outreach in the way that I needed to do outreach for the campaigns that I wanted, specifically when I was traveling or and going away. And they really worked out for me. And then I went and got signed to management. My first management I only signed to for three months because like though they were great, they just weren't a good fit for me. But I remember going through that process being like, oh my God, someone wants to manage me. I should definitely give them, I should give them an opportunity because actually it was really hard to manage myself. Yeah. And it became really, it, all. Yeah. it became really difficult to like pretend to be your own agent and or be an agent and or negotiate and or go back and like get campaigns got really fiddly and, really, yeah. and yeah. it became quite problematic. And I had a beautiful campaign that I did the end of 2022, but it had literally 13 different redrafts. And they'd email me being like, we need this back by tomorrow. That I was like, don't you care about someone else's time? You don't. <laughs> exactly. And so then when management came along, I was like, this is great. Someone's going to take that off me. And I, if anyone's looking for management, my advice is go and do it for a probation period, at least three months and figure out what the fit in is what you want and what you don't. Because though my management was great, they weren't good for me. Mm. And I probably wasn't good for their books either, right? There was a misalignment. There was miscommunication. And the brands that they worked with probably were not the ones that I was focusing on. But I would say until I got management, I wouldn't have known that. Yeah, I think it's massive trial and error. And I've now moved on to a second management. What I would say about managers, and I still talk about this, is that like anyone can technically manage talent. Like there isn't a degree for it or a qualification. Anyone can get into kind of PR and marketing. So with management, it can be so hit and miss. It really depends on the company, but more than anything, it depends on that individual manager that manages you. The company can be great, but you could be given someone who might not have as much experience or might not be specialized in the niche or the brands that you want to work with. So I found that with my first management, there were a lot of changes going on with the firm already. I had multiple different managers in a short space of time because of just various reasons. But ultimately I felt like I wasn't really a priority. They didn't quite understand who I was and they were trying to shape me into something that I wasn't. And I never wanted to lose sense of my identity. And ultimately I was getting more work on my own. So was I. Than what they brought me. So I actually made the decision to move. And I've been signed to my new management for about one or two months and they've been incredible. Okay. I've really learned what went wrong the first time and what they do now has shown me like genuinely the benefits of having management. Like they, my manager tells me every day, like I'm here to make your life easier. Yes. And she does. And I also yeah. management are like, they're also going out and sourcing because it gives them the commission. And so it's yeah. a two way process. You make their lives easier. But I equally agree, like my first manager was great. She was young, she was fun, she was hungry. But the focus areas for them as a firm were misaligned to me. So they were into like beauty and wellness and the creature economy, whereas I wanted to go more into emceeing, hosting, tech, business, career. So a little bit more serious, mm. less fun in that sense. And so I think there was a misalignment, but also I wasn't confident enough speaking out. Yeah, I think neither was I. I didn't want to bug them or neither did I. Or, and you don't want to like bother be a them. Difficult talent, absolutely. But you have to remember your management are working for you. But you so forget that. But that's the same. But that's what I've learned, and that's what I realised is actually being managed is very similar to like finding a job that fits. Yeah, it's okay. There's a probation period for for a reason. It's like you're dating and you're going in a relationship and seeing if it works. And it made me think about my first corporate job, and I was like, oh, I didn't love that either. But because I've learned to find that confidence, in the end, I was like, hey, I don't know if this is the best fit for us. So let's have a conversation. And luckily, they were in a similar mindset. So yeah. we left on really good terms. Yeah. And I still rate them and I'd recommend them. But they're not for me. And so now I'm actually in the process of getting signed to new management, particularly just for speaking and emceeing. But I've also did the difference where I went in their roster. Yeah. I checked who was in their books. I DM'd people in their book. And that's one thing I would say as well is find out from genuine talent what they're like. Because that no one will tell you the truth better than talent. And also your future management won't mind you asking the talent if they're good. Yeah. Because if they know they're good, then they're going to be more than happy for you to have conversations. They're not going to rush your decision. Something that my manager also said to me was that because they don't have the financial pressure to just say yes to every single deal because they're doing so well as a company, they're really well established. So they can actually focus on what I want to do. Things that might not make money, if it's so I want to host an event or I want to put on a different type of campaign, it might not make them any money, but they're happy to support me because that is part of my brand and what I want to do long-term. So yeah, also look at like 
how they are as a management in terms of do they just want you to basically take every deal and force you to have a really quick turnaround don't care about you and what you actually want yeah it's just such a big part and did you negotiate your royalty and commission no because i think industry standard with a lot of management is like a flat fee flat percentage they take 20 percent of yeah all, of everything and that's quite common it's very common. And, I'm, and i'm happy with that because ultimately and i've already noticed it in the last month the deals that they've got me they've already increased the fee by at least 20 percent, if not more so they're doing their job and they're already making a difference in terms of like the money the, the amount of money i'm making is 20 percent more than i would have on my own absolutely so i really want them to take that and also it goes back it. to the relevancy of like burning out and your t time and your cost and your effort like you were saying you worked in consultancy you made the money but if you go down to your hourly rate, you're probably earning less. In this case, you're outsourcing all the admin and the management work. Outsourcing so, is key. So they deserve that Absolutely. extra bit. Yeah, and I think I view it as such a partnership. Like, they work with me, I work with them. We have open lines of communication. We're always checking in with one another. If I have an idea or they do, like, it's just such a seamless process. So I'm really enjoying, like, the management I have now. Obviously, ask me again in a year's time. <laughs> but no, I am really enjoying it. And I think they've taught me what it's like to have good management, but also how to enjoy my job again. Because mm. I think it's so easy to fall out of love with what you do if you don't feel like you're doing a good job, you're not very good at it. And I feel like I had a little bit of a low patch this year where I wasn't quite, my management wasn't quite working the way I wanted it to. I had a few other things going on and it's so easy to think, oh, I'm not really good at this. I'm not really enjoying this. And they've given me this real boost to actually be like, no, like I love content creation. I love what I do. That's great. And that's made me remind me why I do it. And but that brings, you've touched on a really cool thing. And one of those things is it's the network around you that really make a big difference. So I also had a low patch. It's, a, it's good that we're talking about low patches because I think not enough people online talk about it. Like I've had my moments. I've had my sad periods. I've had my depressed periods. I've had my I want to quit periods. I've taken myself offline. And I've come to the point where I'm like, actually, who am I doing this for? but also who really cares? And the second point, what I'm trying to reference with that is no one actually cares as much as you think they care. And so you should be pushing content out that's relevant in your niche and is adding value. And then you should be seeing what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. So I've gone back into like doing travel content because a part of me before was like, what if people think I'm like pretentious? What if they think I'm just X, Y, Z? And then I'm like, no, actually, let me not worry about what people might perceive and let me add value and give them tips and tricks and let me like use this as a platform then to create more travel content. Yeah. And so in Jan 2023, when I started doing travel content again, within like six months, I had two travel brand deals. Plus I was invited to a press trip. I'm not going to say I have as, as many followers as you or like, I'm not going to say that I have as many likes as you or engagement or, or following, but I actually have spoken to a few brands and they've said, listen, don't worry about the views, but the fact that you're adding value and you can see that people are saving content and the fact that you're true to your yourself is actually why we want to work with you versus just being, you know, a creator with 100K, but actually a lot of those are ghost accounts. Yeah, absolutely. I think engagement is so important on in terms of content creation. Every brand knows that now. If you're not checking someone's engagement, you're done because literally that like so many people buy followers so many people could also go viral for things yeah but then they don't have an engaged following because they went viral for like a, a trend or something that has nothing to do with their actual value add niches and again it's like the audience that they gain from that virality doesn't care about that that content so i am really happy growing in a really slow and steady way doing it mm. the right way and building a really engaged community because I know and I tell brands this all the time if you wanted me to get 200 people in a room tomorrow I could yeah me too that's how engaged absolutely is but at the same time have you found that people then want to be your friend or jump on the trends for clout and I only say that because I'm probably not as like influencer slash content creator as you are but I've had that and over the last three years as I've grown and my brand has grown I've seen myself make really bad choices and friends and mm -hmm. potential business partnerships but also people come through pretending to be your friend and then actually then wanting something from you. I'm like, wait, hold on. I thought we were friends, but now you're trying to take what? You're trying to ask for how much money? Like, yeah, I, I think generally anyway, whether I'm a content creator or not, as I've gotten older, um, my friendship circles have decreased. I think that's just a part of life. As you grow as a person, you outgrow friendships, you have less in common with people circumstances change and you naturally drift so that's one aspect I've already accepted and I think that's so healthy and so normal but then the other aspect is 
as I left my corporate job to become self-employed, naturally I'm in a completely different industry, going to completely different events and putting myself in spaces with so many new people. And on the one hand, it's been amazing to connect with people that really understand this life because it's such a unique kind of job and there are so many nuances and challenges to it that like some of my friends who I've known for a really long time can't relate to and that's fine. But then on the other hand, because it's social media and some people are a bit more materialistic or superficial or really care about followers or how they're viewed. I've had some really bad experiences with people who have used me for a really long time, created content with me, no longer want to be my friend when they have more followers than me. And I've learned that the hard way because I'm definitely a people pleaser and I find it really hard to recognize those red flags early But on. do you know what? I'm going to stop you there and just say, I find you so interesting. And I think <laughs> <'cause> since, <laughs> since I've met you, I found you so interesting because you're a couple of years younger than I am, but you have this confidence about you. You're also educated. You worked in the corporate space. You also, for me, it feels like Tanvi is calculated in a, in a way where like you're pragmatic and you're logical. Yeah, I'm really so rational. So at the I'm same really time, rational. I find it really interesting that you feel like you're a people pleaser and you've been burnt with friends because I am not the most logical person. So I can see how I can be burnt with friends. Does that make sense? Like I am actually, I wear my heart on the sleeve. I'm, I'm very impulsive. I make bad decisions with a view that actually I'm really good at failing. So that's what I'm going to wrap it up as. Yeah. And I equally, I'm really nice to people. Yeah. And now I'm like, well, actually it's not that I need to be less nice to people. It's that I need to... I need to protect my energy a lot more. It's right? that. So I'm nice to everyone. Like, yeah. And a lot of people will tell me, oh, you're so like bold and confident and sassy online. Like I always call out people in my DMs and reply to trolls. So they think I'm not a nice person. Everyone meets me and they say I'm really nice and I'm kind to everyone I meet. The problem is that I know my boundaries and that's something I've only learned in the last... I was going to say, when years. did you learn that? Yeah, it's, it's, it was pretty much since I've been burnt really badly in the last couple of years by a few different people. I learnt my boundaries and whilst I do wear my heart on my sleeve and I am nice to everyone, the minute someone shows me disrespect or crosses that boundary, I'm really rational in the way okay. I handle it. Like I don't need to argue, I don't need to be bitchy, I just draw the line Absolutely. and I move on and I think that's where the rationality comes into it and understanding it's nothing to do with me and it's a you problem. It is a them problem and one thing that I learnt about and I really implement in my life are my non-negotiables. So in 2021 and most of 2022, Actually, the start of 2023, I had a few not so cool instances with people who were my friends, mm -hmm. for, for either friends for a while, right? Or and like been business acquaintances turning friends who would just disrespect me. And I have like a three time strike rule. I'm like, the first time, maybe it's a mistake. The second time, maybe it's a second mistake. The third time, I'm like, absolutely not. I remember one of my non negotiables was I'm actually pretty useless after like 6 p.m. But also, after 6 p.m. is very much time for my loved ones because they give me the support and the freedom to do what I need to do, right? So the least I can do is sit down and have dinner with them. And I'd have this certain friend back then who was a friend who would constantly put in meetings at like 6, 7, 8 p.m., never show up, like disrespect to timings, make like really weird, not so friendly jokes like about digs. like, yeah, digs, but like, ha 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 dig ha 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 and I'm like you know when people laugh through a dig and they have like smiley faces and you're like ah oh, you they get to get away with it and you feel a little bit like oh did, was that a dig or were they just was it banter or was it did I did I it's giving me toxic yeah yeah like, giving me toxic underlying toxicity it is giving me toxic but I'm not sure if it's toxic and so I don't want to be the toxic one by saying that it's toxic so I'm just gonna let it like fizzle here so disrespect of my time is really like a non-negotiable now disrespect of money anything you do in terms of business partnerships friendships situationships have to be laid out yeah and three one thing that i've learned from being burnt is always put some kind of contract in place even if your friends going into business situationships yeah it's like even if it's an email contract that is an email contract yeah. i've had clients who have asked her to do 50 60 percent of the work have an email contract and then last minute be like we don't need your services anymore i'm like okay well the old me would have been like oh well, thank you for the opportunity the now me is like, well, actually, legally, you owe me what I'm due and a little bit plus more because you haven't paid the deposit or the first statement. And if that's not the case, then we'll get lawyers involved. And when you go professional, they get scared. Yes and no. I think earlier this year, I started a business with a couple of my friends or mm -hmm. people who I thought were my friends at the time. And we are obviously no longer in business. It didn't go to quite to plan. And I think that taught me 
so much about going into business with friends and things I would do so differently if I ever chose to do it again. I think things like, you, you're right, having things in writing, having contracts in place before you even start anything is so important because you have that to refer back to, it's black and white. But other things like just understanding people's work ethics, the way they've been brought up, how they do things, if those basic morals and values don't align with yours, then it's just never going to work. Yeah. And if you're not able to have like rational, mature conversations as businesswomen, yes. not as friends, because it's so important to make mm. that distinction between the two, if they're not able to do that, then it's never going to work. Mm. And unfortunately, that is what happened. And it's really sad, but it's taught me so much about business and boundaries and friendships. But that is definitely one of the wobbles I had this year that taught me so much about people. And how long did it take you to be comfortable enough to bring that into conversation? So talk about it like in these spaces. To be honest, <laughs> I don't talk about it much at all, purely because... There's no need to. The whole situation was actually quite nasty and quite toxic. And the people closest to me have seen what's gone on. And they've been there for me. And really, that's all that mattered. And it's not something to talk about more in a negative way. Rather, it's, I think, important in this conversation to talk about the lessons. Absolutely. And I, I feel the same. That's the reason I bring that up is because the people who know what I'm referring to know what I'm referring to, right? And yeah. they were there and they backed me and there was a sponsorship and support. But apart from that, you don't need to name and shame. I don't feel yeah. like you need to be catty about it. I feel like it's more like if it wasn't for that incident, I wouldn't have had the relevant contracts in place. I would have not made the business decisions I have. I would have not thrived in terms of being a business owner. And for me, I'm a big believer of, listen, if you can make a mistake on 20 pounds, on 200 pounds, you need to make that mistake on that smaller amount and learn what to do it and manage that money so that 2K or 20K can come through. Yeah, start small, definitely. Like, you know, that burn financially has cost me just under 10K. But in the grand scheme of things, you're lucky it's not 100, right? Absolutely. And in the greater scheme of things, it's, okay, if that burn has cost me just less of 10K, that now means that when I get 10K and I can move it to 100K, I know how to manage that better and I know how to scale yeah. versus making that same mistake on 100K or a million. Yeah. And when you think about business owners and individuals who are self-employed and or freelancers or content creators, one of the biggest reasons to why they are unsuccessful is because they don't know how to manage money. Yeah, that's so true, actually. I think content creation is such a weird space because you could be 18, go on TikTok, go viral overnight, and now you're a content creator and you're earning money from something. And how does that 18 year old know how to manage money like whatsoever? So to one extent, I'm actually really happy that I have the corporate background because I've not overlooked any of the finance aspects of this industry. But at the same time, I see how there's so many people that don't know how to manage money because we're not taught about it in school, but also because people are all ages, come from all different backgrounds in this social media space that, yeah, a lot of people don't know what they're doing. What did you do with the first hundred pounds you made from social media? <laughs> don't even remember how I made my first £100. It must have been in lockdown. I probably just put it into savings or invested it. Did you? I'm, I'm a finance content creator. True, right? actually. So I'm quite money-minded. I'm not afraid to talk about it. I love talking about like financial transparency. And for me, because I had the privilege of living at home, the last like five years of my life, majority of what I've earned has been invested. And I'm very fortunate to be in a position where like now I can look to buy my first house and all of those things. Is but that something you're considering? Absolutely. So I, and I've actively made the decision to not move. Obviously I could have moved out and a lot of people ask me, oh, like you still live at home with your parents. But one, it's part of my culture. Within South Asian culture, like it's such a big thing to still live with your parents when you're in your mid twenties. But two, I would rather, and this is just a personal choice, I would rather not rent and save money. And then I now have, I'm in a really fortunate position where I have the ability to Absolutely. find my dream home. And also, it's such an interesting point you raise. In South Asian culture, yeah, living with your parents is a thing. It's not a taboo. But also, I find it really strange. What's the alternative? Going and renting a house with six different people who you don't know, who you don't speak to, where you have to share one bathroom, where there's no, like, cleaning routine, and it's just not <laughs> great, right? Yeah, I definitely like I'm comfortable. As <laughs> they're, they're, like, what's the alternative to be what in, like, a six bed shared accommodation with no living space like come on like, if you have to relocate for your job or you want to move to london and be in the city and live your best life in your 20s and have that experience i think absolutely do it for me i'm so lucky that i get both like i absolutely. get to be comfortable and live at home i get to see my parents every day who i love but they also give me the freedom 
and to, to go out when I want to see my friends, to have people come over. So I'm so lucky, like mom and dad, if you're listening to this, thank you so much. I agree with it's you. It's contributed so massively. I agree with you. Life. Saying that though, I think when you're younger and you're brown, you don't appreciate no. all of these fun things. And recently I've been having this conversation, I'm like, the older I get, I love being a brown woman. But when I was growing up in my 10s and my teens and my early 20s, I was like, oh my God, so much restriction. Why didn't they let me out? And my parents were super cool in the sense of like, they would pick and drop me to clubs. Oh, I was just about to say that. When uh -huh. I was 18, my mum waited for me to get into a club. What time did they pick you up? Like three. Okay, okay great. So my parents <laughs> picked me up from a club at 11 p.m. <laughs> That's when I was getting there. So I didn't know that. Okay, so, so, so they were cool. But not that good. They ba they basically played me. Yeah. And they were like, you yeah. go to a club. I was like, oh my God, can I? Okay, I want to go to five. They were like, no, one. I was like, three. So we literally negotiated before I went to uni. And they were like, but we're going to pick you up at 11. I was like, yeah, that's fine. What do I know about clubs? I don't know anything. So when people are going into clubs, I'm like, I'll see you later. Yeah. <laughs> I'll see you later. And I'm walking back out. So that was great. But also I think, I don't know about you, but recently I've been doing a lot of travel content, but also traveling with my mom. So we've actually been in the press a few times talking about like a, the mother-daughter relationship that we're building. And for me, it's really important that I give my mum at least that space to be herself, to the sense of freedom. I've got the finances, so I like let her explore the world whilst I explore the world. And what's why not? Because I go on all these business and funky trips anyway. Yeah. But I guess the point being is when I was growing up, I didn't have that like relationship with my mum. Like I loved her. I didn't like her. And, my, and I don't say this yeah. publicly, like I didn't like my mum. I loved her. I didn't like her because I didn't really know her and she didn't know me. But now it's like, she is my best friend and I love it. And there's something about brown, like mother daughter relationship, which I think is not spoken enough about because it's like, oh, sons are the mom's kid and mm. you know, your daughters are the dad's kid. And it's like, well, no, you can have a really good relationship with your parents, still have freedom. And if you don't have that relationship, don't get me wrong, it wasn't always great, but you have to work hard. You have to fight for it. It's not going to happen overnight. No, it's not. I think my parents are the most important people Absolutely. in my life. They're the reason I am the way I am, they've given me everything. Like all they ever wanted was their children to be happy and successful. And yeah, you're right. I only really appreciated that later in life and saw all the sacrifices they've made. And now I'm in a position to give back to them. I do and I, it's so nice to be able to just, even small things like they did so much for me and I could never even repay them for everything I probably owe them. But even just doing small things like taking them out for a really cool meal or taking them away or, I make such an active effort now to do that for my parents. So do I. They just sacrifice so much for us and it's just a nice thing to do. And it goes back to the conversation like we were having about events earlier. When I started going to an event, so I'm like, oh my God, events, people are inviting me. And now I'm like, okay, if I've got some free time, am I going to go to this event where I do, it's just not really adding value or am I going to go see my family? Am I going to go spend time with my loved ones? And you also surround yourself with these people because they don't need anything or want anything from you. They treat you like normal. Yeah. Whereas when you go out and about and you're living this online profile space, you don't know what people want from you. And I think after you're burnt, especially, you go back to your roots. And I know I have at least. I'm like, I want to spend time with my parents, my loved ones and my, you know, really close friends because they liked me before all of this. They don't, Honestly, my friends and family do not care about anything I do online. Yeah. If anything. Uh, yeah, I can completely relate. If anything, I didn't want to start a YouTube channel, right? Just like I didn't want to start this podcast. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be embarrassing. My siblings were like, do you really think there's anything more you can do to embarrass us? <laughs> and I was like, that's such a fair comment. They're like, have you seen what you post online? Like, I think we're good. But at the same time, my family had given me that confidence to go out and do whatever it is that I want versus extracurricular people. But I think when you're younger, you want to be like the white girls. Yeah. And now I'm like, no, I actually just want to be myself. But because I've been masking for so long, I'm now trying to figure out who that is again. Yeah, I can completely relate. Going, growing up, and I remember especially in primary school, I was one of three brown kids in my year. And all like the popular cool kids obviously were all white. So you automatically think being white is cool and being brown is not. And so you want to assimilate to that culture. You want to do everything they do. You want to have everything they have. And I wasn't always in a position to do that. Like... They came from very privileged backgrounds. I didn't. And it was hard as a kid growing up, feeling like you were always an outsider. But definitely as I've gotten older, I've embraced my South Asian culture and my brown Indian identity so much more. And like you, I'm still navigating it, mm. like being with British Asian. But I just love how seeing on TikTok, you see so much more representation in campaigns. You see so many more women of color and South Asian women and, but like we're really making a name for ourselves and 
we're in a movement now where we can be our authentic selves. And like that makes me so proud for like the next generation of brown girls will have all of us to look up to. And I, I think, think so. that's amazing. I think it's amazing too. And it's some of the reasons as to why we do that. So on that note, what is your favorite food from the brown people's cuisine? Oh, oh my God, I love <laughs> Indian food, literally. <laughs> Give me chili paneer, I will eat the whole thing. But I am lactose intolerant. So I should, yeah, fine. I okay, love right. it. But most brown people are. Yes, that was true. Most people are, to be fair. I, I love all Indian food. I love, do you know, like, chana batura? It's like everything. Chole, chole. I am obsessed with brown people food. Yeah. Brown people food. <laughs> I'm just, br- like, the whole <laughs> continent, I love it. If there's I love all Indian food. Yeah, yeah. Me, I mean, I just, I, when I say brown people food, I literally mean the whole continent. And I just generally love Asian food. Yeah, me too. Would you rather... Be a millionaire overnight or have 100K in your bank account over 10 years? Um, oh, here I am testing your financial knowledge. Hey, as in per year? Yeah. Yeah, I'd rather have 100K. Why? Compound interest. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Duh. Duh. <laughs> Obviously, why did you not know that? It makes sense. Yeah, I would rather have it. Would you rather live a day in the life as the founder of Twitter? Or the founder of Facebook. When I say Twitter, I actually mean X. X, right? Uh, so probably Facebook. Oh, you'll be Mark for the day. Yeah, I just feel like they're doing way more and doing like they're much more successful. They own everything. Everything. So that would be way I'm more interesting. Scared of the fact they own everything. I don't actually think about it too much because then it would freak me out. So I just think ignorance is bliss sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Would you rather spend the day as Kim Kardashian or Paris Hilton? I don't really know that much about either, to be honest. You but don't know much. Not, definitely not Paris Hilton, I don't really know much about. You should watch a documentary, it's actually really interesting. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, in a documentary, she really talks about like putting on this character act because her parents were really strict and sheltered her when she was younger. So apparently she's not as dumb as she makes it out. Oh, it's really? all an act and actually she's really like intelligent in the background. Okay, well, I'd rather be her then. But Kim <laughs> K has great skins. She has created skims, but I feel like she has so much else to deal with that just seems <laughs> quite scary and overwhelming. Uh, do you prefer the winter or the summer? Summer. What about the UK summer? I still prefer summer. The days are longer and everyone's happier. <laughs> that makes sense. Everyone's happy. And what do you see yourself doing? What, what does the future look like for Tanby in terms of a career growth? I honestly wish I could tell you, but I think, I would, and I'd be lying if I didn't every single day wake up with a new business idea or look on LinkedIn at jobs and every single day what I want to do somewhat changes. But ultimately, I just want to make an impact, represent the South Asian community, be financially stable, be a good role model. And if I can do that, I will do any job. I love learning new things and I think I get bored very easily. So who knows where I'll be this time next year, what I'll be doing. Well, Tammy, that was great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for showing up. I know that you're busy and also you're very selective. So I'm really grateful that you're here. Showing up. (laughs) Welcome. I have to say that. You you could have declined. It's great. Like, subscribe, share, follow Tammy across all her socials. They are in the description and then catch us on our next episode. You can get involved in the podcast by following at LMF Network or getting in touch via hello at lmfnetwork.com. You can also watch the visual podcast on YouTube and Spotify, Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn. So make sure you hit subscribe, make sure you join in the conversation and share with all your friends, family, and network because, and we say this, 80% of your opportunities come through your network. And so we really wanna make sure that we help you shine.